what we did on that movie was so dynamic and, and truly their request was as dynamic as possible, you know, as low, as fast, as aggressive as you can get. And that was very much Tom's perspective. The nice thing about Tom personally is that because he's a pilot and because he's into this himself, I felt like instead of being a passenger, he was more of a crew member. You are about to embark upon the great crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. I read The Lords of Discipline, which is a book by Pat Conroy, specifically about the Citadel, although it wasn't named, and it spoke to the experience in, um, at a military school, and that was, um, it seemed exciting and uh, challenging, and uh, more to the point, I wanted to be a Navy SEAL, and so I was kind of trying to figure the logical way to go about that. So I, I, something had um, spurred an interest in the SEALs to me when I was really young, 11 or 12 years old, long before they became popular after 9-11, of course, and, um, and then the way to do that through a service academy seemed like the proper way to go and certainly the most cost effective. But uh, I went to the Naval Academy specifically to do that. How did the academy change you over those four years and prepare you for the career that followed? Yeah, a great question. Um, they, they say about the Naval Academy, it's a great place to be from, but it's not always a good place to be because it, it is hard. It's a very different experience. And so I think for me, it was the first chance to really experience perspective uh, and a change in perspective because of military service. And what I mean by that is, all of my friends went to traditional colleges and we all left. Um, we had a very tight group of high school friends and we all went our separate ways, but I found myself at a military academy up at 5 a.m. and um, long days and a very atypical college approach. And um, it prepared me in that sense to be in a career that was very different than what a normal civilian, one of my um, contemporaries would have been doing. And now I, talk, I call it the gift of perspective because I'm very grateful for having seen something different because now in life it, it really makes everything a little bit easier when you come across, across normal challenges. Now, upon commissioning, you went to Pensacola, correct? I did, yep. Yeah, so I had asked to go SEALs, and the Navy, right. like any service, you know, needs the Navy trump everyone's personal desires. Uh, there's no question about that my strengths and weaknesses are better aligned with flying than they would have been with SEALs. Um, and it also, you know, the, the blessing that was unknown at the time is that you can serve for a lot longer in a really operational environment. So as a pilot, even as a 05, 40 years old, 50 in some cases, um, you can still be very active as a pilot in, you know, taking the fight to the enemy. So that was kind of an unexpected um, blessing for us to be able to continue to serve in that capacity for years. What were you flying initially? Uh, so in flight school, we started with the T-34, which has now been phased out, and that's a um, single-engine turboprop, two-seat airplane. Your instructor generally sits in the back. Uh, I selected jets, and I was happy to have done so, and so I moved to the T-2, which was a, a very old, um, kind of a Cold War era um, twin-engine jet that was um, not very advanced in terms of avionics or capabilities, but it was perfect to learn how to fly faster and to do some of the basic jet stuff. And then we transitioned to the T-45, which was a more advanced um, jet trainer, I did that for a year. I actually instructed that for a year and a half after that, uh, before I started in the F-18. But right away for me, it was single seat F-18s out of Virginia Beach, F-18 Charlies, which was at that time really the only single seat airplane you could be in. That was right as the Super Hornet came online. And then um, I flew mostly what we would call legacies, but F-18 A's, B's, C's, and D's for the next 20 years. When was your first deployment in the Iraq theater? 2005. And so what type of missions were you flying? Um, it was primarily Overwatch. We'd call it, um, you know, uh, I guess for lack of a better term, we're on station and ready to go. And uh, we had very few pre-planned strikes back then, um, but you were there in case anyone came under fire. You know, we had a lot of fighters overhead at, the, at that time, Air Force fighters that were stationed there, Marine Corps fighters that were stationed there. We would keep our carrier right in the Persian Gulf in the northernmost section. You still had about an hour transit to get in there, but, um, you know, CAS is the mission over there in most places. That's close air support. And so we were overhead for that. And we would have cases where there might be a ground unit who, who knows whatever they're doing that day or that night is um, uh, elevated risk level. And so they would ask for air support and we would go do that. And then there would be cases where another group of people comes under fire. And so we could be rapidly deployed because we're already airborne and you can cover 50 or 100 miles in you know, minutes. And so that was typically the mission for Iraq back then. Any particularly memorable engagements? Um, gosh, I had, I had a lot. Um, there's this fog of war that happens uh, over there, of course, and so some of the people who were, um, in some cases, if they don't have eyes on, then um, it's hard to really know who the enemy is. And 
uh, back then. I mean, when you're at 20,000 feet, our, our um, capabilities were somewhat limited. We would have perhaps one forward-looking infrared radar that would be a, a, essentially a high-speed video camera that would look on the ground. And it, we didn't always have two in our, in our section of airplanes. And so I was routinely up at 15, 20,000 feet with binoculars looking down, daytime, nighttime, trying to ascertain who was friendly, who was enemy, and then correlate what we were being told on the radios with what we were seeing. And it's really challenging. And there were some cases where we were cleared to employ on people that de definitely weren't enemies, whether they were farmers or children or any number of various scenarios where that's the benefit of having a human being in that aircraft. And, and drone air, air warfare is for sure is the future, and I understand that. But to the degree that I can ever you know, advocate for human pilots still on airplanes, that's the case because you really do know there is this sense. There's the, the spotty sense, the hair on the back of your neck when you just know that something's not right. And so rather than employ and have any kind of civilian casualties, we were the final um, person in that uh, process to say yay or nay. And then it was us who would employ. Um, and so there, there are several instances like that. And there were some other ones where you can hear in the voice of the people we're talking to. And in a lot of cases, it's the JTAC, it's the terminal air controller on the ground, who in um, some cases is a pilot. The Marine Corps definitely uses their own pilots for a year or two in between their flying jobs to put on the ground with ground units. And they understand what we're going through. They understand that we're in an airplane at night. There's not a lot of room for anything. We have charts that we've opened up. We're trying to look on an iPad and correlate with our systems. And so they get it and they understand why we wouldn't just be willing to, to drop or employ willy-nilly. But um, when you hear stress in their voice, because it's a pretty calm, collected group, um, you know you need to do it. And so one of the things that we really took to was an, uh, this elevator response where if we knew our folks were under fire, we would immediately start with a show of force. And that meant just as low as we could safely go, overhead wherever we knew the enemy to be. Because generally having a F-18 or any kind of fighter overhead in the dark of night, it'll scare the tar out of darn near anybody, good or bad. And so usually for the enemy, that is followed by their death <laughs> when they hear a noise like that, right? And so what it would do for our, our folks is it would um, buy them time to just have an airplane down low, ripping it over in full afterburn. It gives them a few seconds to recoup and, and maybe seek cover, that sort of thing. And then we could go through this process where we put um, fire on station, you know, through, through small bullets rather than massive bombs and elevate that response to keep our guys safe. So we did that a lot as well. Phenomenal. Well, let's talk about another opportunity you had uh, shortly after your service uh, in the wars. And that's in 2007, you joined the famed Blue Angels. Um, how did you get that opportunity? Is that something you could pursue or did they ask you to do it? How did that come about? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So we have to apply to it. You asked to be considered at first. And uh, for me, you have a variety of options when you finish your first couple of years flying F-18s in my case. And so you can go on to be a test pilot, you can go to Top Gun, you can be a flight instructor. Those are sort of the traditional routes and they're, they're all great for their own reasons. The Blue Angels are sort of a one-off organization. They'll pick usually two or three pilots a year to join. Um, and for me, it actually worked with my career timing because I'd been a flight instructor prior to joining my fleet squadron. But um, it seemed like something interesting and something different. I love naval aviation. I loved that I was serving in the military. I wanted to share it. Um, the flying sounded exciting, but it wasn't necessarily just the flying, which I think is most people's perspective, that it's just guys who want to rip jets around and be kind of cowboys. I was actually pleasantly surprised that it wasn't like that at all, that when I first met the, the pilots that were flying when I joined, it was the most professional group of aviators I'd served with. Uh, and they really cared a lot about what they were doing. And moreover, they really cared a lot about inspiring the future. And then over the course of the years there, I, I flew with 11 different Blue Angel teams over my time in the military. And um, you, you hear these stories of, of people who you knew to be incredible service members or pilots or you name it, and they had joined the military because of the Blue Angels. And so that gives you this renewed sense of this job does matter. You're not taking the fight to the enemy for sure, but you were most definitely indirectly contributing to the cause because you are signing up the future of, of our warfighters. And it's not just pilots, it's everyone. We bring an air show to the middle of nowhere, Kansas, that has no naval aviation presence, and little kids get inspired, and they end up changing the direction of their life because of it, and it's very cool. So you're an ambassador, really? You very much are, yep. And the Air Force team, the Thunderbirds, use that. I think they call themselves the ambassadors in blue. But we definitely wanted to inspire and motivate and kind of showcase the pride and professionalism of our Navy and Marine Corps. And we can't take everyone from all these little towns to an aircraft carrier, but we can bring a little slice of that to them. And so that's what we tried to do. Now, you mentioned that you flew with a number of different teams 
different personnel over the years with the Blue Angels. Does that take some getting used to, given the precision maneuvers? How easy or hard is it to kind of get in sync with a new group of pilots? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, what we do really well in the Blues is we give ourselves time, time to train, and we give ourselves the assets and the resources. And we were allowed so many training sorties because the risk level is high. You're flying low over the ground, you're flying close to other airplanes, you're flying in had talked about proximity to people. Normally when you're doing aerobatics, you're above 4,000 feet, or in our case, 10, 20, 30,000 feet. And now here we are doing it at five feet or 20 feet, and there's a crowd 1,200 feet away. Not just a crowd, 100,000 people. And so the margin for error is almost non-existent, you know? And so what we would do is train together a lot, hundreds of flights with the, with the same exact people prior to ever being allowed to perform in front of a crowd. And then we would be inspected and certified by both the Navy and the FAA. And so every team is a little bit different. The skill levels of the pilots vary. The, um, the brief and debrief techniques vary. The personalities vary. But what I found was in general, it's all roughly the same with you know slight outliers here and there. But um, everybody's motivated. Everyone's trying to fly well and, and do well and support the mission. So uh, it, was, it was in retrospect fun to look back and, and Remember how the teams slightly were different, but in general, every there was not one team that I thought was a terrible team or, or necessarily one team that was a great team. They were all just um, exceptional groups to be around. So you're like the parent of multiple children. You don't have a favorite? I don't have a favorite. No, no, I love them all the same. <laughs> <laughs> any, did you ever have any close calls at a show? Plenty, yeah. Um, I, I felt like I used up my nine lives about nine times over probably. Uh, but that is, that's the nature of the business. And that's not just Blue Angels, that's F-18s in general. And that's flying off aircraft carriers when everything starts to degrade on you, like I said. And it, it seems to always happen at night and in bad weather, you know, when, um, when things start going wrong. But that's why, um, well, that's why we don't get paid the big bucks, you know. But that's why we, we work really hard to be good at what we do. Because certainly if you're in an airplane and things go wrong, it's not the time to um, lose your cool. It's more than ever um, paramount that you remain calm and know that it's you alone who can take care of this problem and, and you work through it. But that's why we're well-trained and well-prepared and I haven't had any that I thought this is it, but I've had a lot where I was pretty focused on what was happening at that moment. And if you've been to the theater recently, you know one of the biggest blockbusters has been Top Gun Maverick, probably the first big blockbuster after everybody felt comfortable going back to the theaters. And uh, if you were impressed with what Maverick was able to do in that movie, you have Frank to thank uh, for that because he was the actual pilot while Tom Cruise was in the back seat and, and he was filmed there. So how did you, first of all, get this assignment? Uh, great questions. The Navy worked really, really hard to include a lot of pilots. I was the pilot for some specific scenes that I'll speak to, but uh, one of the things I love about how they went about it was they found junior officers to prove to the whole world that these aren't, you know, 20 year or 30 year experienced veteran pilots. These are our youngest guys can do this sort of thing. And moreover, they tried to find the right um, experts in each field of flight that would um, line up well with the movie. So for example, in the dogfighting scenes in the movie, that, like you said, they really flew it. Everything you see on the camera, there was actually an airplane being filmed. And it was the Top Gun instructors that flew some of those dogfighting scenes. When they went off the aircraft carrier, it was the carrier landing officer, the, the, the individual that teaches how to land, for new students how to land on the aircraft carrier, that was flying those scenes. Uh, there were a couple scenes they needed an airplane at a, what I would call an extreme low altitude, something way past where we would normally fly an airplane. Um, traditionally in the Navy, you go down to 500 feet over the ground is as low as you go. And then once you're proficient, you've done it a few times, then you're down to 200 feet. But at that altitude, we talk about mission cross-check times. And so you're allowed to look inside for one second and then you're back outside. Meaning if you want to check your weapon systems, if you want to check your navigation systems. But it, you're solely focused on being outside because of the risks of the uh, terrain or whatever the obstacles or obstructions are. For the movie, they want an airplane at 20 or 30 feet, if, at, as low as we could reasonably go. And, and we just don't do that. And there's definitely a, a, a low appetite for that level of risk. And so someone, not me, who was involved in this process offered up that the Blue Angels do that fairly routinely. Uh, and so could we perhaps include a Blue Angel to do some of these scenes? Uh, unfortunately, the Blue Angels are flying every weekend, 300 days a year traveling, and there's no way to easily pull one of the six pilots away, and specifically one of the two or three that do that sort of thing away to film. I was still attached to the Blue Angels, preparing our new aircraft through some testing and uh, demo regression that I was doing. And so it was a pretty easy um, uh, connection to make. And so I was lined up with the movie for these scenes and I went out, uh, we filmed ultimately over probably six or eight separate weeks where we did uh, the takeoff that starts the movie. The, um, We'd call it a low transition, but uh, Tom Cruise is in um, a Dark Star, you know, a Mach 10 airplane. 
and he sort of dusts the admiral and um, rips the roof off a building. And, and what you see is exactly what happened, as it turns out. And actually, if you were to see the behind-the-scenes footage from further back, the entire set was you know, essentially decimated, actually. Um, they CG'd my Blue Angel F-18 into the Dark Star because it had to be that way. But what you saw is exactly what happened. We do that maneuver every day on the, on the Blue Angels. That is the number six Blue Angel takeoff maneuver, right? So it was easy. I've done it thousands of times, so I knew I could do it safely and have you know, an entire set of people out there and not put anyone at risk. Um, and How then, fast did you actually get that plane going? Well, it's funny. So faster, we, we, did, um, we practiced the day before. And faster is, in some cases, worse. And so as now the movie's out, we can show some of the behind-the-scenes stuff. We had a number of scenes where the airplane's at five or 600 miles an hour at really low altitude, just scraping over um, that building. And it didn't have the desired effect. But if you did it at 20 feet and then climbed right as you got overhead, the way it directs the nozzles and the jet exhaust to the ground, it, it has a very destructive effect on the set. So what we found was, and oh, by the way, the F-18, like any vehicle, has a turn radius that is optimized at certain speeds. And so there's definitely a, a, a band of speed for the Hornet that gives it the best turn radius and, and um, you know, effect of that turn. And so we found that if we were at you know, maybe 20 feet and uh, a lower speed, 400 knots, for example, it was, had quite a devastating impact on the set. And so that's what we ultimately went with because it was, um, I mean, like, like you saw in the movie, it literally ripped the roof off the building and it would have separated by a long distance. There was some conduit that ran through it and the building had some stuntmen in there for you know, visual effect. And um, the director of that movie thought he had you know, almost killed the entire crew because of what it did. Wow. So when I, when, after I landed 20 minutes later, he was, they were all still coming off this um, you know, emotional high from what had happened. Wow. Well, you mentioned the low altitude, and I'm not going to give away the plot because the movie's still pretty recent in case anybody hasn't seen it. But being at a low altitude was critical to the plot towards the end of the movie. But there's also a point where there's a very steep, sudden climb with a lot of G-forces. Mm -hmm. Were you also? I did. I, I filmed. So there's a scene that you'll see where the aircraft is popping. You know, um, Tom will borrow an airplane to run this canyon course at a certain time to prove it can be done. And so that was him with me in, in the airplane. If you're looking, if you see Tom's face, of course, that's Tom. He's in the back seat with me. And if you're looking forward, anything you see shot um, over the shoulder, we had cameras that were you know, on both sides. And that would be, my, in that particular scene, my head from the back. They went to great lengths to make sure it was legitimate because there are definitely people who will try to find inaccuracies in movies. So um, they went to great lengths to make me look like Tom from behind. And uh, we flew that together over and over again. And it, it was very much a dynamic part of that movie, both flying it and then watching it. Uh, and then there was a scene where we were popping, where we came low over the desert. It's a high desert out in Fallon, Nevada, where Topkin is. Um, but we very much a six, seven AG pull straight into the vertical. And there's even a scene where you see the airplane climbing right at the camera, which uh, we actually filmed as well. There was a helicopter that was directly overhead. And we literally pulled right up at the helicopter until the last second. And, and avoided the helo, but got an incredible shot for the movie. Oh, that's, that's phenomenal. Now, Tom Cruise is well known for doing a lot of his own stunts, so how did he handle being in the back seat for uh, this? Uh, Tom was the champ, actually. And you know, it was, thankfully, my time in the Blues, I gave hundreds of guest rides. My, my first year on the Blue Angels was the VIP pilot, so I flew actors, athletes, high school teachers, counselors, a whole wide variety of people. So you quickly learn that you could be an NFL MVP and you're not great in the airplane, but you could be a 60-year-old you know, female guidance counselor and be an absolute stud and, uh, and you can't get enough, right? And so it's, it's interesting to me how some people do better than others. Tom happened to be both, right? So he was, he's a well-known actor known for his own stunts, but he's also very capable in the airplane. And the way they had that, that airplane rigged up, it, the entire, if you're in the backseat, everything was cameras. And you had no forward visibility, just a tiny little sliver on either side of all these cameras. And so it, I would have called it an absolute recipe for air sickness, a perfect recipe, because you, you can't see anything forward. And so any ability to not let yourself get air sick, it, you'd have from looking at the horizon and looking long. And when I'd fly with people that weren't feeling well, I'd just say, look, we'll stop, we'll go straight and level, look straight ahead, watch the horizon, your brain and stomach will eventually get back in sync. And they didn't have that. And what we did on that movie was so dynamic. And, and truly their request was as dynamic as possible, you know, as low, as fast, as aggressive as you can get. And that was very much Tom's perspective. The nice thing about Tom personally is that because he's a pilot and because he's into this himself, um, I felt like instead of being a passenger, he was more of a crew member. And that was an important aspect for me for some of the stuff we did, that it was so high risk and so you know, small room for error, that um, it, was, it was like a Blue Angel Air Show to some degree. You know, we, had, we were on our game 
absolute focus. And we would rarely do we ever take passengers in the Blue Angels, but when we do, it's never during the air show. So it was essentially having Tom in the jet with me for an air show, but because he's flown so much and because he was good at it, it made it um, a heck of a lot safer in my opinion. How'd the rest of the crew do? Especially with the G's. I saw their, like, their, their faces with the Yeah, the that's right. No, I think line. they did great, actually. Um, as I understand, it was Tom's idea to put them through this process, almost like a syllabus of, of prep. Because when they filmed the original one, I don't know who all got to fly, but the, the flights they had, some of them didn't go well because they just weren't ready for the extreme experience. So they started in a Cessna 172 or a, a little bitty civilian general aviation airplane and moved up to more dynamic, um, small airplanes and then into a smaller jet. Uh, the L-39, and then finally into the Hornet. So by the time they were flying with us, they had a great deal of air sense. They, um, their bodies was more, they're more used to it. They were more prepared. They understood the talking and what was happening. They knew when to speak up and when to, you know, to be quiet. And they also were their own directors, right? So they had their own cameras in there, and they were having to manipulate the cameras throughout the course of the filming sessions. So we're just flying the airplane. They're back there literally producing, directing their own movie by, for themselves. And if they didn't do it right, it was, uh, you know, perhaps a waste of twelve or fifteen thousand dollars that they would have to maybe, and and you couldn't always reshoot it the way you want because they had limited days to film, and the conditions had to be exactly the same. And that's a really important aspect. When you watch that movie, you won't see any inconsistencies in that regard. But if we filmed it over multiple days, even the weather alone can very much change the the, the clouds and the sun angles and that sort of thing. So they did a heck of a job. So. How much um, collaboration is there between the studio and the Navy to, to make this happen? I assume there's got to be a ton. There was a ton, yeah. All the way up to the head of Naval Aviation, um, our three-star was very much involved in the process, and, and thankfully um, that was the case because it's a, it's a lot of risk that the Navy's taking on for a movie. But from a recruitment perspective, I mean, it's going to bring us not just Navy pilots, it's going to bring us um, you know, Air Force pilots, British pilots, uh, and then all of our all of the additional crew members that make this whole thing possible for the next 20 years. Um, I almost rejoined. <laughs> I mean, I've been retired for six months when the movie came out, and it was awesome. And so um, it makes you excited about what you've done. So I, I think they were willing to accept that level of risk because of the the possible reward, which they've certainly gotten. Um, but yeah, there was there was a Navy captain whose sole job was just to manage the liaising between. Paramount and the Navy, and the, he did incredible. Were you surprised by what a blockbuster it became? Um, I was pleasantly surprised, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know what the storyline was. I hadn't asked any questions about where the movie was going and who the characters were and how it all intertwined and what happened, you know, how they harken back to the original and how they move it forward. The first one, of course, we joke about it a lot in the Navy, but it has a lot of. Um, inaccuracies. You know, it's a bit corny at di different points. It's why people love it though, right? And, and I think we were all very aware of the fact that if we made this movie the way we wanted it, no one would go. It's a documentary. It's not a movie. So it has to have um, that, that feel to it that um, the drama has to be there, whether it exists every day in our real life or not, right? Um, but I was very much pleasantly surprised with it. Uh, I thought they did an incredible job. So um, thankfully, it's going to have at least the same impact that the original did. So you're saying you never did an inversion like in the original, five feet away from a... Well, so we did actually. That, that movie shows, if you, if you um, it's only for a moment, but if you um, watch the new Top Gun Maverick, there's a scene where Maverick rolls upside down over Rooster, and then they start a dogfight down to the deck. And we filmed that. So I was in the inverted airplane, and the upright aircraft was a gentleman named Pops, who was the skipper of Top Gun, the commanding officer of Top Gun at the time. And we filmed that scene together. Uh, and we were able to do it because of the Blue Angels and, and the fact that I'd flown that exact same maneuver thousands of times. It's incredible. You mentioned uh, before what, what an impact the Blue Angels has on Navy recruitment. Uh, and I think you just alluded to what the first Top Gun movie did. Is it too early to see what impact this one's having? Or? Well, there was an immediate impact at the Blue Angels Air Shows, for example. The, the number of people attending the shows right after the movie was released and then coming to the crowd line to talk to the pilots afterwards with questions. Hey, did this really happen? Can you do this? People who were energized by what the movie had done. So that was, that was absolutely immediate. Um, I'm not dialed in or plugged into the recruit centers enough to know what the um, you know, six months later impact has been. But anecdotally, I think it's going to be massive. I mean, my kids who have you know, followed my career, you know, as children of a Navy pilot, have always been moderately interested at best. And the movie, you know, all of them came out and said, Dad, how can we not want to do that now, right? And so, um, and they had never shown any interest before. So I think it's going to have that impact on, on people far and wide. And what's really cool to me is I had some nights that are very memorable in my mind of, you know, long nights over Afghanistan or Iraq, flying in very challenging scenarios. 
And in some cases, the people I was flying with were, um, you know, my peers were senior to me. And a couple of them, I just remember distinctly how calm and collected and how professional they were in the airplane and how grateful I was to be flying with someone who was such an incredible pilot. And to know that they joined the Navy and were flying 20, 25 years later because they saw that original Top Gun tells me that we'll have the same impact, that 20 years from now there are going to be some really incredible Navy Marine Corps pilots flying over hostile areas because of that movie.